The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. And also with you. Amen, amen. What a great weekend of ministry here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. And with the clear skies and the chilly temperatures, just as I've seen our congregation gathering for worship today, I've noticed the breath that follows you as you come in through the doors. And so I'm so grateful to gather with you on this cold and chilly day. Grateful for you, your presence. Grateful for the ushers opening that door and welcoming everyone in. Grateful for all visitors or those who are here every Sunday. We are delighted that you've joined us for worship as together we glorify the God of creation, of all creation, and the very same God who seeks to be in personal relationship with each one of us, a living relationship. You've selected a great day to join us for worship here at Oxford Presbyterian Church as we experience the gift, the grace, and the call of what it means to be Presbyterian, a very member-driven form of church. Yesterday, we experienced the congregational retreat at the seminary where we focused on God's call in our lives to love the community and love the world. And today, we look forward to the ordination and installation of our, our incoming class of officers, elders, trustees, and deacons, which will take place right here after the sermon during worship. And then following um, our worship today, there'll be a brief congregational meeting as together we again um, practice the Presbyterian form of government by the people. Now, you um, pass through the, the, the narthex or perhaps the office hallway by the lounge and passed by the annual reports. We have annual reports printed, available for anyone who would like to take an annual report home with you. You can also find them online. We encourage you to read how God has moved through our ministry over this past year and what we look forward to over the coming year as well. These are all visible signs of how God is leading this congregation to thrive generation after generation. Every Sunday, and this is true for today, it's it, Every Sunday day is an opportunity for us to connect with one another, perhaps for the first time or perhaps week after week. And so I just invite those who are sitting closest to the center aisle to take this blue friendship pad and put your wonderful name in there and then pass it down the pew so you can greet those with, um, in the pew with you during a passing of the peace in our time of fellowship after worship. Our fellowship will just be through those doors on the right, and we invite you to warm up um, or stay warm with a cup of coffee or tea, some delightful refreshments before going out into this wintry day. If you would prefer to connect with us um, and you're in person, we have a QR code that you can connect with us, but just by scanning that with your smartphone. And for those worshiping with us online, that the link just above this live stream window will take you to the same form so that you can connect with us and we can share with you the ministry opportunities here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. I direct your attention in the bulletin to all of the, the ministry events as well as the calendar. And I'd like to lift up just one of the many opportunities um, in our ministry this week and over the coming weeks, and that is for a continuing intergenerational Christian education opportunity for, for youth and adults ages 12 and up. We continue a five-week series on a creative and really engrossing TV series on The Chosen, and we'll be gathering in the lounge on Thursday at 6.30 for a uh, a viewing of that TV show, and then uh, a, a really uh, group-led discussion that over the past has been really invigorating and very interesting. And we'll be wrapping up about eight. So join us um, for this continuing series in the lounge at 6.30 on, Friday, on Thursday for a lively discussion and tasty refreshments. As this body of Christ continues to answer God's call in the community, it's my privilege to invite Ann Bailey, our chairperson of the Eradicating Systemic Poverty Team, to share with us an update of what the work the ESP team is doing and how we can join the team in mission and prayer. Ann? Thank you. I'm testing the mic. Does it work? Very it good. Does. Very good. <clears throat> what do we mean by eradicating systemic poverty? <clears throat> well, first, let me say what, what it doesn't mean we do not 
replace all the good work that units or committees uh, in the church have been doing for many, many years, actually decades. And by that I mean the work of our deacons, Presbyterian women, uh, mission and outreach, youth group, and many other units that have been providing care and service for, for all of those who suffer uh, in some way from deprivation, including poverty. <clears throat> The Eradicating Systemic Poverty team became a reality a little over four years ago when this congregation became a Matthew 25 congregation and we were asked to choose a mission or focus. So at that time, uh, the mission and outreach team chose Eradicating Systemic Poverty. We decided to go really big here. We wanted uh, a challenging goal and that was what we, what we chose. What do we mean by eradicating systemic poverty? <clears throat> and this is taken uh, from our Presbyterian Church liturgy. Eva e eradicating poverty refers to changing laws, policies, plans, and structures in our society that perpetuate economic exploitation of people who are poor. The, uh, an example when I'm speaking of systemic change. An example might be to support uh, the cha changes in zoning laws in our community to enable this community to have affordable housing. When I speak of affordable housing, I'm talking about housing that would be priced at less than median household income. And that housing therefore might be higher density housing, which may mean change, change to some of our neighborhoods. And as you know, change is always difficult and sometimes uncomfortable. That's what we mean when we talk about structural change. Uh, <clears throat> we know that um, Poverty is complex and overlaps with other social ills and oppressive structures in our society. And therefore changing it is not easy and often takes time. Our team works closely with social service agencies, government, health services, philanthropic groups, educational and economic institutions, and many others in the faith community as we work to identify the ways that people are trapped into lives of poverty, and then we work to bring about change, which sometimes may, may take a while. <clears throat> we know also that poverty can be exacerbated by climate change and violence. One thing we've done this past year, uh, so it's really not even a year old, is to join hands with the Oxford Homelessness Network to create a new group here in our community called OSH. Many of you have heard of OSH, which stands for Oxford Area Solutions for Housing. And this group focuses specifically on affordable housing and homelessness in, in our community. And yes, we do have homelessness. I've visited the homeless camps. I've talked to the people who live there. And it's, it's, it's a bleak living situation for them, especially at this time of year. Presbyterian Church USA provides us with a theology behind eradicating systemic po poverty. We believe as Reformed Christians that Presbyterian Presbyterians believe that government is God's agent when it comes to the providential care of people. We know as Presbyterians that to evaluate any economic system, we cannot do it simply on the basis of the material goods and services we provide, but we must evaluate it on the basis of its human consequences, what it is doing to, with, and for people, especially those who are the most vulnerable among us. Thank you. Ann, thank you. Thank you so much. much. I, as, as Ann was sharing, I was remembering that from our discussion on the chosen, we were thinking of Jesus as a carpenter. 
Well, in the Greek, the word tekton, which is often translated into carpenter, is also translated as peasant. So, Anne, you just remind us of, of, these, of these realities throughout time. And Jesus was also identified as a peasant, someone who was poor. I invite you to continue to learn more about the work of the Eradicating Systemic Poverty Team and OSH. Um, you'll find um, regular announcements in the bulletin as well as um, our voice and online. And so um, if you have any questions, please talk to me or talk to Ann Bailey during our time of fellowship or anyone on the Eradicating Systemic Poverty Team. As we come to this time of worship with gratitude and hope, the psalm for this Sunday is Psalm 62. And it'll be the focus of our liturgy as we begin with the call to worship and our prayer of confession. But I'll share two verses from this, this psalm as we cross the threshold into full and authentic worship. The psalmist writes, For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is in the Lord. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Let us turn our hearts and our minds to worship our living and loving God. Good morning, church family. Good morning, choir. Uh, as Pastor Lawrence said just a moment ago, our scripture reading this morning is Jesus calling his disciples uh, out of their fishing boats, uh, and he called them by name. And as I think about this story, I am reminded of how meaningful and important and how personal it is for us when somebody calls us by name, when somebody knows our name. I'm sure that uh, many of us can probably remember the first time we walked into a church building that we didn't know very well. Uh, and we can also remember the people who knew our name, who welcomed us by name, and how meaningful that is and how important that is. For Jesus to call his disciples by name is a reminder that we are ultimately God's children, that we are ultimately created in the image of a loving God, and that we are claimed by God. And so as we gather together into this worship space to worship together and to glorify God, uh, we just want to extend that welcome to you, to know that you are called by the living God by name. You are welcome in this place. We welcome your age, your race, your point of origin. <clears throat> Friends, whether you are devout with faith or whether you walk into places like this with some doubts or questions or even skepticism, Friends, we welcome your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your political leanings, whatever they may be. You are welcome in this place, no matter how you are abled, physically, mentally, emotionally. Beloved, you are part of the body of Christ. And we seek to extend that welcome to one another because it is Christ who welcomed us first by name.
So, beloved, at this time, uh, I invite you to uh, join me in standing as you are able, either in body or in spirit, as we come together for our call to worship this morning that you'll find printed in your bulletin. <coughs> Please join me. From God comes my salvation. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. God alone is my rock and my salvation. God is my fortress. I shall never be taken. Friends, our first hymn this morning is hymn number 401 in your purple Glory to God hymnals. It is here in this place. We will be singing verses 1, 2, and 4. Good morning, church family. We may remain in the shadows of our past, but Christ knows how our brokenness may become whole and filled with light and abundant life again. We mumble our words, but Jesus leans in close to listen and whispers grace and hope to us. Inspired by Psalm 62, our time of silence for personal confession is integrated into the prayer or confession this morning. After each stanza in our prayer of confession, a bell will be rung, inviting us to hold a sacred moment of silence prayers together. Let us pray. God, we gather as a distracted people no matter where we are, someone or something wants our attention. For your God. We are offered endless solutions that will make it all clear, solve all our problems, guarantee our happiness and success. Anger and resentment are so much easier than the challenging work of listening and serving in Christ's name. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. The sounds of wealth, power, and status have tremendous appeal. 
Slow us down into silence today, O Lord. Transform our fears into trust as we follow you along the way of life. For For God alone, my soul soul waits in silence. Amen. Please join me in our responsive assurance of forgiveness. Jesus listens. The Spirit's power is at work in our lives through God's steadfast love. We will trust in the Lord who is our rock, our salvation, the source of our deliverance. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. As the body of Christ here in the sanctuary and everywhere, may the peace of the Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's make sure that everyone worship, worshiping today with us feels abundant love in God. Please take a moment to turn to one another and share the peace of Christ. If your neighbor is someone you have not yet met, Please introduce yourself, for all are welcome in this place. Thank you, friends. Welcome to our time with young disciples. It is so good to see all of your faces here this morning. And we, if we have any other children or young disciples that would like to come forward, you're so, you're so welcome. We love seeing your faces. Uh, it's so good to see all of your faces this morning. And I wonder if we can turn our faces around and look way up in the balcony. You probably see there's a camera way up there. We may have some friends watching at home. Can we wave to them and say good morning? Let's try that again. I think we can do that a little louder. Let's wave to our friends at home and say, good morning. Good morning. There we go. And there's our friend Michael. He's waving good morning to us. Can we say, good morning, Michael? Good morning, Michael. Oh, amen. So good. So good. Hey, friends, um, I have a, uh, I've got a pop quiz for you this morning. Are you ready? I have been thinking about names this week, and I wonder... If you can raise your hand, if you know your last name. Oh, you do. What's what's your last name? Very good. What's yours? Hey, very good. What's your last name? Marie. Marie. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, good job. Yeah, this is pretty easy peasy. Oh, you guys are so good. Yep. Yes, excellent. Good. Okay. That was the easy round. Here comes a slightly harder round. Raise your hand if you have or if you know your middle name. I have two middle names. You got two <laughs> middle names. All right. Uh, let's go real quick. Lightning round, real quick. Yes. 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 Oh, very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Well done. You all passed. Uh, you know, I have always, won- sometimes I wonder, you know, what do our middle names mean? And I'll tell you, when I was growing up, I just, I, I thought 
my middle name meant that I was in trouble because I, only, I usually only heard it when I was in trouble. If I heard my mom say, Marcel Allen Von Bullock, that usually meant, oh boy, I probably did something I wasn't supposed to do. Uh, but that is not what our middle names mean. Uh, our names uh, are, 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 a lot of times, they're family names. Not all the time, but sometimes they're family names. And they remind us of the people who gave us those names. And they also remind us of our families that we come from. And did you know that when Jesus called his disciples, he called them by name. He knew their names and called them by name. And uh, when they heard their names, they knew that they were God's children, just like we are all God's children. We are our parents' children. We are also God's children. And our names remind us of that. So uh, this morning, we have something very important that we have to do because we are thinking about all of God's children this morning. And uh, Miss Ann Bailey uh, just came up a little a few minutes ago and was talking to us about some of God's children in the neighborhood who uh, need a little bit more help, uh, who are, are especially in need of care. And one of the ways that we try to do that is I'm going to reach into this box. What, what do you think's in this box? We've got buckets. You know what we do with these buckets? It is our Community Change Sunday. Surprise! <laughs> uh, this is a Sunday where if we have um, any loose change in your pockets, it doesn't have to be much. It can be pennies, quarters, dimes, nickels, European currency, whatever it may be. <laughs> um, we collect some of these and in the, in, we collect those into these buckets. And that change goes to help support Tops, our Oxford Food Pantry. Um, it also goes to support our community meals. And these are ways that we try to care for God's children in the community who really need help. But I really need your help this morning. I need you to stand up. Stand up. I need one helper. Me. All right, you. I heard your name. For, I want you to take these buckets and pass them out to everybody so that everybody gets a bucket. We've got lots of buckets. And why don't you help them out? Why don't you take a bucket, pass it around? Okay. Now, to all the adults, whoa. It's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, if you have some loose change uh, that you would like to give this morning, uh, do us a favor. Help us out. Would you raise your hand? And if you see someone with their hands raised, t take a bucket to them. Go out. Go out. My lieblings. And let's... <laughs> oh, yes. I hear some good, some good... Planking of change. <laughs> and so, friends, as the chaos is ensuing, uh, this is one of the, I just want to take a, a moment to, again, remind you, this is one of the ways that we seek to eradicate systemic poverty in our own small way here at Oxford Presbyterian Church uh, to try to uh, support these organizations in our community that are seeking uh, to extend care uh, to those who are in need in our community. And I'm very, very grateful for our children and young disciples who are helping us do exactly that this morning. Oh, man, you guys are so good at this. We, oh, we got, oh, you already, see, you were already on top of it. You got the choir. That's great. Is that everybody? Excellent. Efficiency. I like it. All right. All right, friends, let's come up back to the circle. And now we have something else very important we need to do. Let's see. I need, I need, listen up, listen up, listen up. I need an orange bucket and a green bucket. Nice. Okay. Hold these buckets just like this. Everybody else, take your bucket and dump all of your money into these two buckets. These two buckets. I see you, Lola. I see you getting in there. And when you're done, when you're done, your, your bucket goes back in this box. Just stack your bucket right there. When your bucket is all empty, put it back in the box. I'll is that one ready? I'll take that one. I'll take that one. Thank you, thank you. All right. Dump, pour it in. And then put it in the box. Very good. Lola's got an empty box. Do you have, you have an empty box? Listen, an empty bucket. Sometimes my brain doesn't work early in the morning. It's fine. All right, friends. Wonderful. Thank you. Can we give our young disciples a round of applause? They did such a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, let's make our circle. Let's make a circle this morning. You guys were great. You guys were great. Okay, let's, let's spread the circle out a little bit. We want to make room for everybody. All right, this is a little bit more like an egg, but that's okay. Yeah. 
All right, put your hand in the center of the circle like this. Both hands out. Cross, shh, listen up. Put one arm over the other arm, just like that. Join hands with your neighbor. Very good. Friends, we remember every Sunday that no matter who you are and no matter what you do and no matter where you go, you are always loved by God. What was that? Anyway. <laughs> but we don't keep that love uh, cooped up here in the circle, friends. We send it out into the world. It actually works. Very good. Shh. Okay, listen. Listen very carefully. Listen. Listen closely. To all of our grown-ups sitting in the pews this morning, do you have a blessing for our young disciples this morning? Amen. Oh, thank you. And do we have a blessing for all the adults this morning on the count of three? One, two, three. Awesome. Hey, friends, may God be with you this morning at church school. And thank you all for helping us eradicate systemic poverty here at Oxford Presbyterian Church. Friends in faith, let us join our voices together in the unison prayer of illumination. Saving God, source of our calling, your word is full of our power and glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we may receive your grace and live as your beloved children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Throughout this lecture a year, we will be returning to study the Gospel of Mark often. Following Mark's account of Jesus' baptism that we studied last week, we come to the Gospel record of our Savior calling the first disciples. Let us open our ears and eyes, our hearts and minds to God's Word. From the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, starting in the 14th verse. Now, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the word of God. And he was saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is drawing nigh. Repent and believe in the good news. Then as Jesus was passing along the coast of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew, they were fishermen, and, and they were casting their net into the sea. And Jesus called to them and he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately, Simon and Andrew dropped their nets and they followed him. Farther along down the coast, Jesus saw John and his brother James they were sons of Zebedee, and they too were fishermen. And they were in the boat, and they were mending the nets. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And immediately, John and his brother James left their father Zebedee and the hired men in the boat, and they followed him. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. Thank you, Judy. In the gentling wave of advancing years, we may find ourselves reflecting back on the unforeseen events and the outside influences that have shaped our lives. During an interview for his memoir entitled Surrender, Bono from the musical group U2 was asked about a pivotal year in his life. The year was 1974. Born with the name, first and last, as Pastor Mark has helped us remember how important that is, born with the name Paul Hewson to a Catholic father and a Protestant mother, Bono and his family embodied the union that many in the nation or the, uh, the island of Ireland sought to achieve. But extremists had other plans. When Bono was 14 years old, Protestant, paramilitary extremists planted and detonated four bombs in and around Dublin that killed 33 people and wounded over 300 during an afternoon rush hour. 
One of those bombs went off at a busy intersection right outside of a record shop where Bono stopped to listen to music every day. He wasn't there that afternoon because a bus strike compelled him to bicycle to and from school. Bono says, I didn't dodge a bullet that day. I dodged the carnage. A few short months later, the same year, 1974, Bono's maternal grandmother died. And while the family stood at the graveside, Bono's mother experienced a stroke and passed away a few days later. Bono says that his father couldn't speak of his wife again. Fourteen years old, living with a grieving father in a war-torn country, Bono shares, quote, the wounds that loss opened up in my life became this kind of void that I filled with music and friendship and an ever-increasing faith. A friend named Googie, they, they all had nicknames for one another. Googie introduced Bono to Christianity that has shaped his life. At churches and at youth gatherings, Bono found direction and a name to attach to, to the sense of the divine. He said it struck him to the core and it still strikes him. Bono writes in his memoir, The Bible held me wrapped. The word stepped off the page and followed me home. I'd always be first up when there was an altar call, the come to Jesus moment. I still am, he says. If I was in a cafe right now and somebody would say, stand up if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, I'd be the first to my feet. I took Jesus with me everywhere and I still do. We'll return to Bono in a moment, but right now let's recall and study the words that Judy so well shared with us a moment ago from the Gospel of Mark. After his cousin John was arrested by Herod, Jesus began a ministry of sharing the good news of God, and his message echoed at John's, saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. Or, in other words, the time is now, God is present, change your life and begin to live as it is true that God is present. Then Jesus stepped beyond John's message, an example of ministry, and Jesus did something new. In verse 16 of this first gospel to be written, Jesus began to recruit followers, and the church has named them disciples. To be a disciple is to focus one's life on God. To be a disciple is to focus one's life on God. And with God as the source and center of our lives, Jesus showed us the way into life-giving relationships with people and indeed the world around us. In the midst of a grief-stricken family and a war-torn nation, Bono found God as the source and center of his life through a relationship with Jesus. For Simon and Andrew, James and John, Bono, you and me today, God meets us where we are, not where we pretend to be. Jesus doesn't meet us where we pretend to be either. Jesus meets us where we live and work, in our greatest joys and our most difficult suffering, in the classroom and in the kitchen, on the sports field, and in the tent of someone without a home. Jesus meets us where we live every day. And in today's passage, we glimpse the beginning of a world-changing movement. Jesus called people to follow him. In the words of Presbyterian pastor Stanley Ott, this is the with me principle. In the with me principle, Jesus invites us into relationship. The with me principle is about freedom and mutuality and respect while traveling a path of discovery. In the with me principle, we invite others into relationship. The with me principle is not about being an expert or a guru. The with me principle is not, being a, is not about being a tyrant or an authoritarian. The with me principle is about calling and opportunities and choices. Let us never forget that Jesus did not change the world by writing a single word of sacred scripture. Everything that we have in the New Testament was written by Jesus' followers, not him. And Jesus did not change the world by founding a dynasty to rule over an empire. Jesus changed the world through the with me principle. 
Jesus called women and men to journey with him, who in turn called others to journey with them, who down through the years and generations have called others all the way up to you and me and all of us today. Like Bono's friend, just too good to keep to ourselves. Like the circle that concludes our time with young disciples, God's love is too good to keep to ourselves. Each one of us here is called to reach one here. <clears throat> Invite a family member or a colleague to the chosen Christian education series right now or the Lenten small group series coming up in just a few weeks. Invite a friend to worship, to join youth group, or perhaps our Caring for Creation team or Eradicating system Systemic Poverty team. Invite a family member to bake for tops with our Bread for Life team or to join a Presbyterian women's circle. Jesus' calling of the first disciples in this passage offers us the wonderful opportunity for just a moment today to unpack this word calling, because it's not a word out there, it's a word right here. Session is our church council in the Presbyterian church, and at our session meeting on Tuesday, we watched and discussed a short reflection on call. The presenter of that reflection paraphrased Martin Luther with these words, saying that calling is the way that God accomplishes work, amazing work in the world. And God accomplishes this work through us without resorting to force. Let's take time to absorb that teaching. The presenter was a fellow named Jim, Jim Merhut. And Jim says, God could force us to all be good people and do the right things. But Jesus taught that force is not what God is about, and that's not how God chooses to work in this world. Instead, Jesus taught again and again to those who journeyed with him that God's core identity is love, and it's an invitation to love and to serve. Jesus' calling to us is rooted in love and freedom. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God calls us to love and then allows us to respond in his presentation, Jim asked the question, so when does God call us? He answered, God calls us all the time. In the streets of Dublin and on the Sea of Galilee, in the corridors of Miami University and Talawanda schools, in the fields around Oxford, in our shops and offices and clinics, around our kitchen tables and in support groups, God is calling all the time. If Calling is how God accomplishes work in this world, and calling is always happening. And God constantly invites us with daily short-term callings as well as longer-term callings that fill us with, with meaning and purpose over the longer seasons of our lives. In our discussion at the session meeting on Tuesday night, a ruling elder helpfully shared that the word opportunities spoke to them more than callings. We encouraged one another at the meeting, claim the word that speaks to you. Opportunities, choices, freedoms, these I consider as first-rate synonyms for Luther's use of the word calling. If calling is a concept that is new or slightly awkward for you, then Jim in the presentation offered a compelling example for us to think of this in a new way. Jim said, Think for a moment of how you respond to God's call this morning to rise out of bed. And consider how you will respond to God's call of love as you rise out of bed tomorrow. Notice that God doesn't force you to get out of bed in a loving frame of mind. God invites you. Jim continued, every person that you meet is an invitation from our loving God to share love with this world. This is one of the most powerful ways that God builds king, the kingdom of God on this earth as it is in heaven. Jim concluded by saying, relationships really do matter. Everyday callings matter. Jesus knew what he was supposed to do with this precious life. When we know what life is for, then nothing is better than that. Nothing is more transformative than that. Jesus called Simon, Andrew, James, and John, Mary and Martha. Jesus also called those like Paul, who initially 
persecuted the first disciples of Christ. Jesus also called Paul Hewson, Bono. And Bono writes in his memoir, I return to a spiritual master like the Apostle Paul. I go to someone who overcame himself, this zealot scholar who ended up a traveling tent maker, paying for his own manual labor and passage. One who faced jail and death threats, who learned that love is not sentimental but tough, and that love is about speaking hard truths to power and sometimes hard truths to yourself. The one who fell off his horse on the road to Damascus to begin the most important journey of all, the journey to be still. Here I feel like Bono is channeling our Psalm 62 for the day. Bono continues writing, The journey into being still, the vast distance from talking to listening. And he concludes, It's an extraordinary thing, the moment of surrender. The moment to get down on your knees and to ask God to save you, to reveal itself, to kneel down and ask to be carried. Thank you for those words, Bono. So friends, how will you respond? Jesus offers us the choice. God calls us to respond. God calls us to love, and we are free to respond. What will you do with your precious life. Amen. And I invite the congregation to be seated as I now also invite those who are being ordained and installed as elders, trustees, and deacons to join me. I invite Katie Curry, Bryson Fears, Billy Maynard, Mike Murray, Jen Walter, David Woods, Steve Flea, Debbie Kelly, Gwen Pitsu, Ginny Scott, Karen Shear, David Croucher, and Sterling Williams to join us up here. This is an example, just one example, of responding to call, of responding to God's love in this world. Our deacons and trustees and elders, I invite you to just, let's array ourselves along the steps here as we face the congregation. These are precious moments. This is an example of how we are called to to continue the church that is the body of Christ from generation to generation. These deacons, elders, and trustees were elected by you, the congregation, in November, and they have begun their service this year, and now it is our time to ordain and install them. And Pastor Mark has some verses from the Apostle Paul, the one who responded to call. Pastor Mark? Thank you. Friends, from his, uh, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul writes, there are varieties of gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. 
There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Amen. Thank you, Mark. For those here being ordained and installed, we are all called into the church by Jesus Christ through baptism that we celebrated last week, and we are marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. And within the community of this church, some are called to particular service. You have been called as trustees and deacons and elders. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry among us continues for the providing for the care and compassion in the world and the governance of the body of Christ. Judy. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, Oxford Presbyterian Church now ordains Steve Flea, Debbie Kelly, and Gwen Pichu to the office of deacon and ordains Katie Curry, Bryson Fears, and Billy Maynard to the office of ruling elder, and installs each of these to active service on their respective boards. The session then installs to active service those who have been previously ordained as ruling elders. They are Mike Murray, Jen Walter, and Dave Woods. The session also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained as deacons, Jenny Scott and Karen Shearer. And the session installs David Krauser and Sterling Williams to active service as trustees. Friends, as I turn to you, I now ask the questions that are part of our Constitution in the Presbyterian Church USA. Do you trust in Jesus as your Savior, acknowledge him Lord and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal, and to God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church? as the authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and to do? And will you be instructed and be led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? Will you faithfully continue your obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be guided by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you seek to serve the people with energy, love, intelligence, and imagination. Will you? I will. And for our elders, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship and nurture and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? I will. For our deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people to help the friendless and those in need. In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? And for our trustees, will you be a faithful trustee, giving the administrative affairs of the congregation your devoted attention, encouraging generosity, and diligently stewarding the resources entrusted to your care? Will you? And now questions to the congregation. Do we, the members of the church, Except as elders, Katie Curry, Bryson Fears, Billy Maynard, Mike Murray, Jen Walter, and David Woods. And as deacons, Steve Flea, Debbie Kelly, 
Gwen Pichu, Jenny Scott, and Karen Shear, and as trustees, David Croucher and Sterling Williams, each chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? We, we do. do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow <laughs> as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who is alone, is head of the church? Do we? We, we do. do. At this point, friends, I invite all who have been ordained in, in the Presbyterian Church as a deacon, an elder, or a trustee to come forward for our symbolic lying on of hands. This does take a moment, but this represents the continuity of leadership from generation to generation. <laughs> friends, I invite you to come into somewhat of a circle here, and we will lay hands on you. Come on in, come on in. Very good. Debbie, you can come. Please join me in this blessing. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you all <laughs> thanks and praise. Throughout the ages, in every time and place, you have chosen your servants from among your people to point the way to your salvation by grace. We are grateful for our ancestors in faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. We praise you for the prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and truth. We thank you for the women and men of every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life to set others to free. Appointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon your servants, whom you have called by baptism as your own. Grant them the same mind that is in Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pastor Mark. Friends, I invite you to join me in our congregational prayer in unison that you will find printed in your bulletin. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> For those sitting in the pews, if you would join me extra loud. <laughs> Gracious God, pour, pour out your spirit upon, upon your servants, whom you have called through baptism, baptism as, as your own and marked as your own. Grant them the same mind that, that was in Christ Jesus. Give them the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church and strengthen the common life of your people and to lead with compassion and vision in the walk of faith and the work of ministry. Give to your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility and humor, courage and an abiding sense of your presence. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us congratulate those who are here who have just been ordained and installed with a blessing and a handshake of peace and friendship. Thank you all. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Congratulations, Karen. Thank Good you, to Mike. see you. It was your hand on my shoulder, right? That's right. That was me. <laughs> Friends, it is a full morning. It is a good morning, uh, and we have much to celebrate and to be grateful for as we do indeed welcome our new officers, our new elders, our new deacons as we congratulate them and uh, thank them for their leadership and service in our church. Uh, as the people of God, as the body of Christ, uh, we do seek to glorify God by supporting one another through our prayers of celebration and gratitude. And for those of you who also have prayer concerns this week, we lift those up as well. 
We lift up our prayers of joy and celebration, uh, not only for our new elders and deacons who've stepped up into new leadership roles uh, at the start of this 2024 year. Uh, we also lift up our prayers of gratitude for the wonderful congregational retreat that we enjoyed uh, yesterday at the seminary church uh, just down the road. We give thanks <clears throat> for all of the, uh, uh, for our leadership, for our volunteers, uh, for each of you who schlepped out on a chilly Saturday morning to participate. We offer our thanks and gratitude to God. Um, and also, a little birdie uh, tells me that Scott Walter is celebrating his birthday. Uh, I think his birthday is on Monday, but I think he's celebrating this weekend. So we lift up prayers of celebration for him as well. Lord, in your grace, hear our prayers. Uh, friends, we do lift up uh, some prayers of concern this morning uh, for Greg Hellworth, uh, who is on a medical mission journey to Mali in Central Africa. We just simply offer our prayers uh, for Greg as he's doing that good, important work. We continue, uh, of course, to pray for our, our siblings in Christ uh, in Gaza, is Israel, and in the West Bank uh, in the midst of the devastating conflict. We pray for those in Yemen, in Syria, in Iran, in Pakistan. We continue to pray for our beloved in Ukraine and in Russia. And we just offer our prayers that the light of God's peace uh, would dawn in every area of conflict. Uh, we pray this morning for Nancy Sturgeon, who will be at Woodland Country Manor for a short stay uh, after a brief hospitalization. Uh, we also pray for, uh, for Charles Techman, uh, who has moved to Woodland Country Manor. Uh, we lift up continued prayers this morning uh, for Brian, who is living with ALS. We, can, we pray for him again this morning. And also we lift up our continued prayers for Larry Hardy, for Karen Simpson, for Bill Brown, for Jay Fry, for Tim Techman, for Bill Jenkins, for Wayne Houston, for Jan Reinhardt, for Ron, for Connie Everhart, for uh, Connie's daughter Anne in Kenya, for Janie Hesse, for Vi Suit, for Jim Bear, for Nancy Gates, for Ray Patterson, for Amber and Peggy Stitt. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And once again, let us pray. Holy God, we lift up this, these prayers this morning, and we also pray for the leaders of our community, our nation, and our world, that they may lead us and guide us and focus their eyes on you. We pray for ourselves, O oh God, when we bless with our spoken words and curse with them just as easily. We pray for those who are ill and those who are facing end of life. Give us the gift of prayer, O oh God, that we may pour out our hearts to you, and we pray for your church, that we may hear and respond to your call to be fishers of people. Hear our prayers this morning, O oh God, both the prayers that we speak out loud in places such as this, but also the prayers that we hold silently in our own hearts that are known to you and you alone. We lift them up in the name of the one who called his followers out of the boats and who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we also lift up our prayers of gratitude and celebration for each and every one of you, for your uh, continued generosity uh, that makes the ministry and the mission of our church possible. Uh, for those of you who raised your hand earlier during the Loose Change offering, I just want to offer uh, thanks and gratitude for supporting our young disciples and our mission here. Um, as we come to our time of offering this morning, I would also just direct your attention to these cards that you will find in your pews this morning. These cards represent uh, a variety of the different gifts that make uh, our church ministry possible. Uh, there are our monetary gifts, of course, but there's also, there, are, there are other gifts as well. The gifts of your time, your energy, uh, your volunteering, uh, your Im energy, imagination, and love. All of these gifts matter, uh, and they are what make us a, a vibrant and missional church. 
So this morning, as we come to the time of offering, I would just encourage you to also place one of these cards in the offering plate this morning uh, as a symbol and as a remembrance of all of the gifts uh, that matter and are important uh, as we seek to glorify God together in the hope and the prayer that all of these gifts would glorify and praise the gift we have first received in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your generous giving of time, talents, and treasure as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. Beloved in faith, thank you for your generosity and grace. Truly, we have the joy of God's love and abundance in our hearts and on our lips. Let us join our hearts in the prayer of dedication as we ask Jesus to change our lives here in Oxford and around the world. Oh Lord, our Alpha and Omega, our beginning, our end. Though you are eternal, we bring our gifts before you in the here and now. Help us to live each day fully aware of the gifts that this life truly is. 
Bless these, our gifts, and use them. We pray that, our, that others may hear the good news. We offer these gifts and prayers in Christ's holy name. Amen. And amen. Let's sing our final hymn of praise. The first and third verse of I Sing the Mighty Power of God, hymn number 32. responsive blessing as we close this time of worship and go out to share Jesus' love with the world. May the God of amazing grace renew your sense of call and inspire you to go out and share the good news of salvation, hope, and love. With our very lives proclaim, Amen. Through this time of worship, we go into the world ready to serve. Hallelujah. Amen. Friends in faith, how will you respond? Jesus offers us a choice. God calls us to love this world. The choice is ours to respond with freedom and grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Alleluia. Amen. Please be seated for the postlude.